I visited his name on the wall many a times, and uh, he was on the first call up there, and uh, I was told he died on his first day. When it, when he died, I I didn't I didn't have uh, I really didn't have any feelings about it, and I thought to myself, I thought, God, what's wrong with me that I'm not having these feelings? And um, a few months later, I went to. Uh, I was, go I was asleep, and I had a, a dream. Because in basic training, we used to nudge each other. I was kind of serious, and he was kind of jokey. And he, he would come up to me and imitate one of our drill sergeants, who was a, was a tyrant. He would get in our face and say, man, don't you fuck with me, boy. <laughs> and my friend Don would come up to me, and he'd go, uh, hey, man, don't fuck with me. I'd say, oh, man, don't do that. You know? He'd go, no, man, don't fuck with me. And he'd keep doing it. And eventually, he'd break me down, and I'd start laughing, and I'd say, hey, man, don't you fuck with me. Anyway, fast forward, he's passed away a few months before, and I had this dream that I was uh, floating in outer space <laughs> somewhere. And I'm floating in outer space, and I see him, Don, floating in outer space also. And we sort of float near each other, and he says, uh, hey, man, don't fuck with me. And I said, no, man, don't you fuck with me. And then uh, he, uh, he said, uh, I said to him, I said, are you OK? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm all right, you know? And we kind of smiled, and we floated away from each other. And when I woke up, um, I cried. Oftentimes they'll say, I've never told anybody this before. Uh, here comes 9-11, and, um, uh, and I was under the first plane going into the North Tower. My memories, uh, my Vietnam memories, um, went from two-dimensional to three-dimensional in ways I had never imagined. And so I was remembering things. In some instances, I felt like I was remembering things for the first time. You're in a fire fight, your buddy gets shot in front of you, someone's just lost an arm and a leg, you've just killed somebody, the helicopter goes down and crashes, whatever. Some kind of horror comes in your life, uh, some kind of trauma, and you may not even notice it at that time because you're fighting for your survival. Animals get that when they get shot or they get a near miss with a car or something happens in, in the wild like a lion attacks a gazelle doesn't kill the gazelle and it goes off because it gets scared off, the gazelle eventually comes out of the unconscious state and starts shaking, violently shaking, goes through, works the trauma out through that, then gets up and runs away and is fine. We don't tend to do that. We hold it in our body and what happens is that story begins festering. At first I was on like 17 prescriptions and you know, all the doctors saw them, you know, they want to make sure it's healthy. Now I'm on about 13. And I'm still trying to wean myself off them in time. But I'm, uh, because my uh, head injury was so bad, uh, I'm an insomniac now, and I cannot sleep without them. So, excuse me, so <laughs> they gave me like seven meds, you know, to sleep. One of the biggest gifts that anyone who is with a vet, anyone who's come back from war, is to sit with them and to be ready, to be open to the stories that they may want to share. That camaraderie that Brian and me and the other vets have is, you know, we want to be around each other. I mean, I just met Brian today, and I feel like I could just, you know, hang out with them all day. We could just talk and, you know, get along. That's just how it is. I would like to see America really stand up for vets and really get behind them. And whenever it gets uh, political, where they're trying to chintz on them, I, I'd like to see Americans make a loud noise and start making phone calls and make sure our vets get what they need. Well, as of right now, I'm unemployed. And to a lot of people, they think that's awesome. Actually, for the first two weeks, it's pretty cool. It's pretty relaxing. But after that, uh, it's not. It's a... Uh, you have so much time to think about, uh, you know, things in the past. I noticed on a couple of the, the backs of a couple of the jackets of other Vietnam veterans there was it said, a nation um, 
that forgets its defenders is a nation that will be forgotten. Uh, when you're in the military, you want to get out. And then once you're out, you're like, wow, I really want to go back in. There's no median. And then you realize that once you get into the civilian world, the transition's really not that easy. I was given an order to open fire into this field, which is a village in the, in the distance, as you can see. And to me, it didn't mean much of anything. It was like an open field, and we're testing our guns again. And so we opened fire, and you know, hundreds and hundreds of rounds of this ammunition we fired into this field. And, uh, and then I gave the, uh, the order to cease fire. As soon as I gave the order to cease fire and the guns got quieted, there's people jumped up, some people jumped up out of the field. There's about a half a dozen. I, I see that vision over and over again. And these people jumped up out of this field and ran into the woods. And uh, there's a part of me, that's when the horror hit me. That's that place of where I talk about the horror that goes in, is that I realized that there was other people in that field, and they were hiding in that field. And they weren't just men, and they weren't people dressed in black, and they weren't the Viet Cong. They were probably people in that village, because there was men, women, and children in that field. And uh, I came back from that, and... Uh, started realizing, I said, you know, I'm not going to obey an order unless I know that I can, uh, I'll take full responsibility for what it is, And because I didn't know what was going on there, and I've carried this around with me, this guilt of what I've done uh, all my life, and uh, I have a bit of an authority problem at this point in my life, when someone tells me to do something, usually it's like, no, and I I have to make the decision I want to do it. So I kept it hidden until one day, uh, my second wife, we were in Philadelphia, and we were downtown, we were going to get something to eat down South Street in Philadelphia. And she said, let's go over to the Vietnamese restaurant there. And I said, uh, no thanks, I don't want to, let's go somewhere else. She said, don't you like Vietnam food? And I said, I said, it's, Vietnam food is great. I says, I, uh, I can't take the smell. And she said, if you like the taste and you can't take the, take, take the smell, what's that about? And I says, it reminds me of Vietnam. And it's the first time we've been married five years that she knew I'd been in Vietnam. When I was a child, I would w be woken up at night by my mother's screaming in nightmares. And she had been in the concentration camp. So I knew the horror of the victim. But it wasn't until I really spent time with the vets and was able to be part of the healing process that they were in, that I really appreciated the nightmares and the horrors that they carried. We were prepared to die, but we were not prepared to be disabled. Mm -hmm. If we died, we would have died honorably for the country. Great. If we lived, we would have got lucky. But you never once think about being disabled and not being the same person you were. I realized there was a lot of vets out there, part of them were still in Vietnam. And now I see that with the Iraq and Afghan vets, that part of them never comes home from war. And that it's up to us, those who have felt like we've started our healing, to go back, sort of, and like put our arm around and say, come on, the road back is with a brother, it's not, it's not alone, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do it with the bottle. You don't have to do it with drugs. My listening can bring a deeper holding of it. It doesn't have to be held by that person so tightly. It allows a bigger holding, and that eases the burden. If a guy can talk to another guy, uh, a veteran can talk to another veteran, um, I just think it... it um, it, it starts to break down the isolation, which I think a lot of veterans understand that. And that's the part that, that's the part that veterans can help each other with, and that's the part I feel like um, we have a right to expect that from our communities, from our families and friends, uh, or people in general, in terms of like um, helping veterans to be restored.